Welcome everyone to the first Bookspan Baker team, your housing market pulse. Uh, super excited that you are all here. And uh, the goal is, is to do a 10 to 15 minute tops, hopefully uh, simplified version of what's going on in the economy, housing and interest rates. Um, and we're going to run through a little PowerPoint. I know that's not very exciting, but that's okay. That'll help us uh, stay on track. Um, and this is our market update for June 2023. Um, I'm Todd Bookspan, the co-founder of the Bookspan Baker team. I've been in the mortgage business for, gosh, over 20 years. And uh, Matt, my wife, Tara, and I have been business partners now for uh, just over 11 years. Seems like yesterday, Matt. Well, 12 in June. I mean, we're we're in June. So this is 12 years. 12 years. I, that's, I stand corrected. So uh, there's... yeah. None other than Matt Baker. What's up, sir? Hey, how's it going? Excited to be here and excited to just kind of break it down in what we feel like is a very simple way. Um, I'm Matt Baker, as you mentioned, been in the business, gosh, hard to say the real number, but 28 years and um, you know, seen every part of the business. So excited to kind of share some of that knowledge with everyone on the call and, um, and let's get into it. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, we just... <laughs> You know, we we talk about this stuff every day and we talk to realtors and clients like Matt just finished teaching a three hour class to real estate agents today. And um, our goal is just to answer the most common questions. And, and I've been teaching a group of financial advisors for a little over a year on a monthly basis. And what I started doing was a quick segment on economy, housing and rates and their financial advisors. I think they should know this stuff. And what I thought was going to be a 10 minute segment typically runs 30 minutes to an hour and a half one time. And, and I feel like we could do a simplified version, a shortened version. I for promise we won't take an minute. hour of your time. <laughs> oh gosh, please no. So we're going to talk through econ economy, housing and rates, like I mentioned, mentioned. So we're going to start off with the economy because that is the thing that is a big news today. So we're going to start off with what's happening. All right, Matt, what do we got going? Well, you know, this week in particular is just kind of a special week because we got not only um, inflation, the Fed also met today. And so there's just been a lot kind of in the news about the economy and what's happening. So this chart that you're looking at is the consumer price index, which for, for, for lack of a better term is the inflation report. And there's really two numbers. There's a headline number and there's a core number. Now the core number is actually what the Fed, the Federal Reserve, which we'll talk about in a minute, really keys in on but if you, as you can see, the headline number, which of course makes a lot of sense, gets a lot of the press and a lot of the headlines, has gone from a, essentially 9% down to 4%. So that's a really big and good move over the last year. And it's been what all of the Fed raising of rates has caused, right? So finally, some of that inflation has started to peel down. Now, to the dismay of interest rates a little bit, which we'll talk about, the core number hasn't fully come through. And a big part of the core number is what they call shelter. It makes up 43% of that number. And so the shelter number um, has been a little bit stickier. And the reason it does is because it's a, it's a nine to 18 month average, like a rolling average. And so as you would expect, if you're looking still 18 months ago, the economy was in a much different place. And so that number has takes a lot longer to work its way through. So if you jump ahead to the next slide. So let me just throw one thing in here real yeah, quick. Yeah, go for it. Um, I would say, well, actually, I guess maybe two things. Number one is our inflation is the arch enemy of long-term interest rates, number one. And number two, right. the Federal Reserve, their target number is 2%. 2% on the wholesale, I mean, on the uh, on the core number. Correct. Correct. So, so even though the headline is basically, you know, 2% away, it's not quite to where, you know, we're at 5.3 or 5.4 in the, in the wholesale, I mean, in the core number. So we're not quite to where they want to be. And it's why they've added verbiage in their latest report that says, Hey, we're going to, we're going to pause, but we're going to be very, very careful and potentially raise rates further. But this particular slide is interesting to me specifically because one of the big things that COVID did is it increased our personal savings rate. And you can see this slide exponential increasing in, in your savings rate, but then look how fast we've spent it, <laughs> which is kind of a scary, a scary proposition that a lot of our savings have now been depleted with this extra cost. 
And so one of the things that's very difficult to gauge is are we buying out of necessity or are we buying out of want? And if you combine this personal savings rate slide with the next slide that talks about credit card use and credit card debt, I would tell you that that adding these two together puts that percent, you know, that that outlook of, you know, that that consumer spending has to slow down. One, our savings has started to bottom. And on top of that, our um uh, you know, the credit card usage has gone up exponentially. So at some point, there's this median or this this kind of balancing act that'll occur. And I think that's why you'll start to see some of that inflation number edge down because really growth uh, and, and the economic growth is kind of fuel to the inflation fire. And as growth slows, so does inflation. And as Todd mentioned, long-term rates will then start to ease. Yeah, and I would say one thing, remember on inflation, inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods, right? We had a goods shortage during COVID. We had too much money during COVID. And then now you can see people have have stopped saving their money. They're spending it. And now look at this debt piece that's going up, which is kind of scary. We see it on the mortgage side in our in our clients' loan applications, you know, with the number of new cars and you know, high credit card balances. So then the big news today was the Fed and that. So kind of a apropos data, I kind of have one of these market pulses, right? Get kind of digged into this. But but for those that don't know, the Fed is the Federal Reserve. So the Fed, and we'll just use that shortened term, you know, for this purpose, it sets monetary policy. So their job is to is to use all the tools in their arsenal to tame inflation. Obviously, inflation, if they need to be at 2% and it's above that, they're going to throw various tools at it to try and bring it down. Their whole goal, even if it disrupts economic activity, their goal by mandate is inflation at 2%. So they're either going to slow down the economy, um, when which is kind of where we're at now because inflation is too high, or they're going to speed up the economy when growth starts to slow and inflation is now under control. They don't want inflation to be too low. Again, they want it to be at that 2% target. So the big tool that the Fed uses is that increasing the bank's borrowing rate, which is also known as the federal funds rate, but that's the rate that they're moving. Now, it makes a good note is that the Federal Reserve and the setting of that federal monetary policy does not directly correlate with interest rates. Now, it is an indirect correlation, which essentially means it, it plays a part, but it's not the whole picture. So just because the Fed paused rates today or next month, the rates go down or they go up again, doesn't necessarily mean mortgage rates are going to follow suit. You know, they, they run sort of in a separate window based on a few other economic factors, not just what the Fed is doing, which is, I think, a common misconception, Todd. No, I totally agree, right? There's so many people who get worried about that. And the Fed is doing that bank borrowing rate, which is what they loan a bank money from today to tomorrow. That's the shortest possible rate. And we're talking long-term rates, um, but it does drive up the other borrowing costs, right? When we show that high debt rate, it drives up auto loans, it drives up credit card rates, drives up home exactly. equity line of credit rates, all those other things as well. And so it just does make life more expensive. Um, but what they're trying to do is slow down spending um, and also slow down job growth. Um, all right. So Matt, what happened here with the Fed meeting notes? So this is just a, a, a one is the Fed meets eight times a year. Most people think they meet every month. They meet eight times a year. They do happen to run in a window where they meet this month and then next month, they also meet again in six weeks. Um, and so they're looking for what this pause does because their meeting is so close in July that they're just sort of pausing to see more data. And they're going to get uh, end of quarter because the June quarter will end. So that second quarter of 2023 will have ended. They'll have a lot more data to use. And then you, I think they're calling this next July meeting a live meeting. I mean, it's real time. There's going to be a lot of data that they're going to digest. And that's going to really show the direction, I believe, of the second half of the year in terms of interest rates. But I just put the little blurb in here today um, on from the committee uh, commentary directly that they're just going to hold, hold the target rate steady. And they you know, put a lot of other fancy words in there, but basically what you need to know is that they're putting a real, what they call hawkish tone, a real uh, kind of a, 
a downer tone to sort of placate the fact that they didn't raise rates today, but they don't want the economy to go, you know, they don't want the speculators to go too crazy with, hey, this the Fed, Fed has stopped raising rates. We're now going to pause and hold for an extended period of time. So they left verbiage in there very open-ended for potential future rate increases. And I think they did that by design. They just want to slow down uh, the speculators because as you know, the market moves heavy on speculation and they want to quell that as much as they can. I love it. So so we're su super failing at getting done in 10 minutes. I'll just warn you all right there. The other part <laughs> is we do have chat open and feel free to ask any questions and we'll answer those at the end, but we will do our best to get through these next two segments in five-ish or so um, minutes because um, you can see how detailed it is. I get, had Matt give the short version to all those answers, but Matt could have given us an hour, um, an hour conversation on it. But let's kind of dive into housing, right? Because most people, 83% of people's net worth at retirement historically is in their home equity. So housing is something that's near and dear to us. It's near and dear to all you realtors who are on the call. And then I'm guessing the those of you on the call who aren't realtors are thinking about buying a home, owning a home and wanting to understand you know, what is going on. And this is the million dollar question, right? Are prices going up or down? And I think it's really difficult. I always say you have to remember that when you're listening to national news, that's national news. And you got to figure out how do I get local news to where I'm at? And, you know, most of the people on here are from Arizona. And I can tell you that I looked at the Cromford report, which is the biggest data source, the most accurate data source for Arizona specific and year to date, uh, the price for price per square foot average on homes is up 9%. So they, uh, through five months. So it's a 20% annualized increase when Matt already told you that the feds trying to slow down housing prices. Um, and so really, we've just got a few slides on housing. And I think this is what we all want to hear. So Case Shiller is the one report nationally that we hear about the most. Um, we got FHFA, which is the government. That's um, you know the folks who oversee Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then we got CoreLogic, which is one of the data providers. And you can see all their data is actually pretty similar. Um, last year, housing prices were good up through the middle of the year, and then they went down. And then you can see that we had kind of a, a little bit of a pause nationally where prices softened in the summer all the way through January. And January is when, if you remember, there was one day um, where rates dropped down into the fives. They were 5.99 as the national average. And our team saw a huge spike in mortgage applications um, in January as that happened. And we saw a lot of closings in uh, February, and March. And so you can see here now, Case Shiller's predicting nationally a 4.6% increase in 2023 for home values. And you can just see here that all of these major indices um, are showing these month over month increases. Um, you can see that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is also showing something similar, right? If you if you know Fannie, they're you know the biggest buyer of, of mortgage-backed securities and basically the biggest funder of mortgages. Um, and then really they kind of talk about the fact that we had these unicorn years, right? 2020 um, through 2022. Um, were really this this crazy time where life was just so different. It was different um, from a lot of reasons, but really the biggest one besides interest rates being the lowest they've ever been historically. Right, we had low rates in the in the twos and threes, uh, but look what it did to nationwide appreciation. And those of you in Arizona know that we shot up, you know, 40, 50 percent. We were uh, super blessed with with how that went. And even last year when he saw those down months, we were still 5%. So I love the fact that they use this unicorn years terms because really that's what you have to look at it. So many people are stuck because they love their their low mortgage, but they don't love their house anymore. And they're struggling with how to get, how to get past that. Um, and so just a, a few other slides and then I'll be quiet and let Matt give his two cents. Um, if you look here again, this is pending listing. So people in the news want you to think that housing is horrible right now, but yeah, it's horrible compared to 21 and 22, these unicorn years, but actually compared to 2020, 2019, 2018, 2017, looks pretty darn good for the number of homes that are pending sale, meaning they're listed and they've got an offer and a contract on them. Um, this is showing traffic, um, right, for March over the last seven years. And you can see that other than the two unicorn years, um, we're crushing traffic, people wanting and looking at buying homes, um, you know, as compared to, uh, you know, 2017 through 2020. Uh, median days on market, again, they were super low, meaning the from when a house listed to when it actually closed, you know, a 30-day close of escrow is normal. So you can see here in 2021, in 2022, you put a house in the market, it went under contract, it closed 30 days later because it wasn't on the market for very long. And so when you start looking at this, you can see that, you know, in 2020, when 
when it's when COVID started out, people were a little bit nervous. The housing market wasn't great. It was kind of just a normal market where, you know, someone to sell their house in two months isn't a bad thing. Um, but we got spoiled by these uh quick turns on selling your home and not having to really market it, not having to have it staged by a realtor, not having to have it marketed properly by a realtor, because people just needed houses because we were in such low supply. And the scary thing is we're still actually in pretty low supply. Um, and so here's kind of that number. You can see, you know, uh, it wasn't even a healthy number back then, 2017 um, through 2019, over a million um, homes um, listed in May of each of those years. And then you fast forward to now, I mean, we're almost half of that, um, still more than the unicorn years, which is great. You have more of a choice out there, but still historically low inventory. And that's why prices are stable. That's why you can see that that people are wanting to buy homes um, last couple of years, again, months of inventory, you can see, I mean, two months inventory the last couple of years, that's terrible. We're only at 2.9 right now, um, where four was kind of the norm, uh, meaning that there was enough housing, houses that it would take for the each sales, it would take um, you know that many months to sell. And so last year in 2022, the Arizona number I just saw was there was about 9,000 homes sold in May of last year. Um, this year, we had 8,100 sold in May of this year. So think about that, where everyone's telling you housing's dead. It, that's just a 10% um, lower ho holes or home selling. Um, and that's why prices are so stable because we still have such low inventory. Um, so last slide on housing, it's all about supply and demand, right? We just know from economics, if you took that in any level of school, that um, you know as, uh, as demand increases, that increases, puts pressure on price. As supply decreases, that puts pressure on price. I, as I mentioned, Inflation is caused by too many dollars chasing too few goods. And guess what? There's just too few goods out there. Um, what do you want to add on the housing stuff, Matt, since I blew through that pretty quick? The only thing the only thing to note is that this is national, so it's not Arizona. Arizona is roughly currently, based off some numbers I saw, about two months of inventory. So not much different than what you saw. But one thing, just to, going back to that slide that kind of shows the, the, the annual gains uh, over, over time, you know, yes, we had those unicorn years, but over the last 50, and if you even go out a hundred, we average four and a half percent annual appreciation. So, you know, we're right in line, even in a market that's quote unquote slow and soft. And, you know, there's all these question marks with these higher interest rates. We're still at, at, at a normal, what you would consider normal. And so it just goes with saying, we got a little spoiled at 15, 20% home ownership appreciation. But the reality is, you know what? The market can't handle that. And this is a good result uh, that it doesn't hand, it won't handle that. But you know what? Four to 5% is what you should expect in real estate. Some months, well, years will get seven and eight. Um, but but right now, you know, I think you got to be loving if you, you know, want to buy a home with the opportunity for four to 5% this next year, if not more, uh, you're going to be in a pretty good place versus renting. You're talking four to five percent appreciation, correct? Uh, yes, exactly. Perfect. All right. Well, let's shift gears to rates for a second. Um, and um, again, we're not going to spend a ton of time on this part. And again, chat is open if you want to ask any questions. Um, but the real question that we keep getting is why are rates so high? Like people kind of wonder, you know, they all assume that the Fed correlation is part of it, but um, but it's really kind of interesting right now. Um, and this is a little bit nerdy, but really thought it would help people understand. So a lot of people in the mortgage industry watch the 10-year treasury and they watch what the 10-year treasury does because the 10-year treasury tends to move in unison with 30-year mortgage rates. In fact, here's a chart back to 1970s and you can see the green line is 30-year mortgage rates and the blue line is the 10-year treasury and the average spread is about 1.72. Um, and the US treasury is where a lot of foreign countries buy U.S. Treasuries just as a safe investment spot. A lot of um, a lot of insurance companies buy the the Treasury. It's just a safe haven for people to park money. Um, and so, right now, you can see that um, this chart shows that although the average is one point seven two, it shows that when we have we've had these spikes in um, life over the last couple decades, where the spread has increased, right in the in the 89 to 2019 range, it was actually lower, 1.66. But you can see it kind of peaked up and hit this 3% line a few times. It hit it during the financial crisis in 2010. And then we hit it again here when you look at it in 2023. And so all of a sudden, if with a normal spread between the 10-year and the 
30 years, 1.72. This just tells you that people aren't as interested in buying because again, it's supply and demand. If people are buying a lot of mortgage-backed securities, then it should push down um, the yield, right? The, the if people are buying it, they drive the price up. The price goes higher and the yield on a bond goes lower, drives interest rates lower. Um, and they're not. So they because there's a lack of demand, part of the demand during COVID was artificial of the treasury buying bonds. Um, and now that now that demand, artificial demand is gone. And so here's kind of what it shows in a bar graph, which I liked. It just shows that if you take the 10-year um, treasury spread, a rate of 3.625, which was the recent number, and you add on that historic average of 1.72 on the left, mortgage rates should be at about 5.37. Um, um, if you take the actual rate, which the national average rate, according to Freddie Mac, was 6.85 um, last week, um, then that's that's a 3.2 spread. It shows that what that graph we just saw is really accurate. Um, and even if we got back to 2.25 spread, just because people start um, realizing that, hey, this is too high, it always tends to come back. Anytime you get that far away, it tends to shrink. You know, that would potentially put us back under 6%. And, um, you know, I think that what our belief is, is that I already mentioned, we had a spike in applications, a spike in purchases, a, a decrease in inventory when rates hit 5.99 for one day. Um, so, so certainly believe that that will um, happen down the road. Right, Matt? Yeah. And, and one of the points to that previous slide, those circles indicate uh, recessionary times. So, so one of the things in recessions is rates get raised in order to slow down the economy to tame inflation. These are high inflationary periods, those circles, which also then correlates with higher interest rates for mortgages. Uh, and that spread gap widens because there's not as much interest because there's all this other debt that is being you know, brought into the market as supply and demand, as Todd talked about. So it takes a little bit for that to settle back down. But I think in summary, you know, we're at a turning point. You know, data suggests that the inflation is coming down. Um, and I think that's something that you can walk away from this, you know, 20 minutes saying, you know what, in inflation is coming down. The Fed is putting all of their sort of tools to work. Uh, and that a rate spread to me is a favorable indicator that we're that it's going to rebalance. And when it does, at, naturally, we're going to get better rates. So I think there's going to be a time, call it a perfect storm, when you know the Fed now stops raising rates, uh, inflation is kind of closer to their target. Uh, you know, rates then improve. You have this rebalancing of of the rate spread, and then of course the housing supply is kind of the overarching um, you know tough tough thing because as a homeowner or a home buyer, you know we don't want to go back to the days where you had to you know, pay more for a, pro a property, uh, all those kinds of things, uh, you know, where you have to waive inspections and appraisals, it becomes more challenging. Um, although that may happen again, I think the conversation though is if housing supply remains tight, your investment is safe and sound because it's going to continue to appreciate. And you can always refinance later when rates do come back down. So I'm in the camp that whether it's six months, nine months, 12, 18 months, you know, my crystal ball, as you say, Todd, is always a little foggy, but I do believe, I do believe that rates will be lower in the future. And I, I believe the 5%, you know, five, five and a half target rate is something I'll throw out there as, you know, we'll see if that comes true uh, in the next nine to 12 months. Um, so that'd be my, uh, you know, we'll, we'll check every month that when I do these calls, when we do these calls, if I'm, if I'm right in nine to 12 months, I don't mind putting myself out there, but, but, but ultimately that's what I would take away uh, with today is that, you know what, you know, we're in a good place. Rates are improving. You know, there are is homes to choose from, albeit um, maybe not as many as we would like. Uh, but the reality is we're poised for a really good second half of the year. If you want to jump in the housing market, it'd be a good time to do it. Yeah, I, I agree. And so let me just throw a couple of other um, thoughts in there, right? That, you know, we talked about supply and demand and that, um, you know, uh, prices don't fall when supply is tight. Um, and then this whole idea of will more buyers come in the market as rates go down? And so CNN did an article on this um, about two months ago. And in that article, it, basically the summary of the article was is that um, people felt that that the average person felt that rates were too high for them to buy now. And if rates hit five and a half percent, that they were all going to jump in. And so I believe this is a great time to buy. 
um, because you're not having to get in a bidding war. Like Matt said, you're not having to waive inspections. You know, you may be in a bidding war. If, if you have a house that's priced right in great condition, um, you know, we had a client right. recently, 14 offers on a house. They were competing. And luckily we had pre-underwritten their loan um, and we had reached out to the listing agent. We helped them secure the, the listing, which was awesome. Um, but I believe that the people who wait for rates to get lower will end up paying more. I think they're going to pay more for the house. Um, and then they're not going to be able to get any money from the seller towards closing costs. One of the strategies we're using, which you may or may not be able to take advantage of, is a, what's called a 2-1 buy down. I won't bore you all with the details of that, but it's how you get a, a lower interest rate for the first two years with the strategy of refinancing when rates do drop in the future. And I'm in that I'm in that camp as well. Um, we, we just updated our free buyer and seller guides. If you go to bookspanbaker.com guide, if you're thinking about buying or selling a home, it's a great uh, tool. It just helps you think about what is important out there. And uh, we've been using this guide and updating it a few times a year now for the last, gosh, decade. Um, and so I've got a good friend who uh, helps us and puts that together. So that'd be a great resource. And then you can always email us, just bookspanbaker at Fairway MC, or you can reach out to me or Matt on social. We'd be happy to answer any questions. And, and I would just say that, um, you know, the bottom line is this, is that um, there's always a, the, the market's always right for somebody, whether it's you or not, um, I would say. The real estate professional who you referred to here would be a great resource for that. Um, you know, whatever member on our team, whether it's me, Matt, or one of our other loan officers on the team who recommended you show up here, you know, they would be a great resource for that. We're happy to, we're happy to help. Um, and although I lied up front when I said we were going to go 10 minutes, we went 26 minutes, Matt. Um, so going forward, I we're tried to talk fast, to but not too fast. Market update. Um, and uh, well, just for the we'll, record, I did tell people it was 20 minutes, so I'm only six minutes off. And I originally said 15, 20, and then I thought, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to nail this in 10 to 15. It's it's me, the I'm a, the eternal optimist. Um, and the last thing I'll throw out on interest rates, you know, I, I love that you're willing to put yourself out there with a with a prediction. Um, and that's really the belief. The, the gurus of interest rates in the industry agree with Matt and that rates will start to come down as we go later in the year and, and into next year. But I, I do believe that you can never time it right. And um, because there's mortgage strategies you can put in play to help you on the cash flow side for now, without it being an adjustable rate loan, it's not like the loan's going to go up to 10% in, you know, when the two years is up, you'll know what the ceiling is. It's set for the next 28 years um, on most of them. There's actually um, different versions of that loan, but the one that we primarily use is, a, sure. is what's called a 2-1. But I, I would definitely, if you're thinking that this is your year to buy a home, this is your year to invest in real estate, whatever that looks like for you. Um, I would just be thinking about, you know, it's the whole idea of what Warren Buffett does, right? Warren Buffett is the greatest investor in the world. He does the opposite of everyone else. So when he sees all the people going out there and buying houses, he's the guy not buying houses. When he sees nobody buying houses, guess what? He's the guy that's going out and buying houses. Um, and ironically, he owns manufactured home companies. That's uh, that's his gig. Um so those are my closing thoughts. I see no questions. Maybe we were that brilliant, Matt, or maybe we just overwhelmed people, even though we were doing our best to simplify it. Um, what what last thoughts do you have before we knock out of here before 30 minutes? I just want to thank everyone for coming and just know that you know we're here as a resource for you. And although this can be confusing time and the economy and housing and rates and all that kind of comes into play, know that you're, you're talking to some experts. I mean, you know, I think early in my career, I was always you like scary to use the word expert but you know we've been in this business a long time we look at things we read things we're constantly evolving and growing um you know talking to experts but also doing our own sort of thought you know deep dive into some of the stuff so you know i think you're like, you're in good hands if this is the place that you're coming for um for advice or for info particularly in regarding those three categories we talked about housing uh, economy and rates and, and i'm just here to, to to say welcome on this journey and if you have questions let's uh let's jump offline and get get some of those later yeah two last things right we we don't we're we're not in the business of sales we're in the business of advice and so therefore even if you're thinking i'm not going to buy till 2025 or 2026 or maybe you're a parent and you think hey how do i get my kids down this route of home ownership it's okay. You don't need to be buying now in order to, to pick up the phone and reach out to us. We would love to connect with you. And then if you're like, oh my gosh, that was super fast. I'd love to see it again. Um, we have the world's most pathetic YouTube channel. However, this video is going to go on there tomorrow and it's going to make it that much better. If you go to YouTube and look up Bookspan Baker team, um, you will see this <laughs> on there. And then you will see over the next six months that uh, Matt, myself, and the rest team are going to make that a lot more valuable tool for all of you because people have asked us to put in 
the YouTube world out there, the advice that we give on a day-to-day basis, one-on-one, they would really like us to have that available for others who are too shy to talk to us. So um, thank you again. We really appreciate y'all being here and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the next call, 6 p.m. the second Wednesday of July. You betcha. See you then. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mr. Baker. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right. Take care.